Good evening, this is the curriculum workshop for Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education on Monday, October 28, 2019 at 7 p.m. at Whittier School. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi. Here. Member Hanna. Here. Member Harris. Here. Member Olchik is absent. Member Samanti. Here. Member Weiner. Here. And Member Hughes. Here. There will be an extended reception of visitors following the workshop presentation. We ask that anyone intending to make a comment during that time fill out a card and, <laughs> and turn it in at this time so we can adhere to our 30 minute time frame and give everyone a fair opportunity to speak. All right, and at this point, we're going to just dive right in with the curriculum workshop with Justin Sissel. First, happy to welcome representatives from our Building Bridges organization. So please allow me to bring Peg Delaney and Mia Sharma forward, and they're going to tell us a bit about this organization. Hi, my name is Mia Sharma, and I am one of the co-chairs for um, Building Bridges Parent Teacher Group. And this is Peggy Delaney. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then Peggy will, and then we'll just tell you a little bit about um, Building Bridges as a whole. So I live in Downers Grove. I work in Downers Grove. My children go to school here in Downers Grove. Uh, I work at Hillcrest School as the school secretary. Um, my children go to Downers Grove North. Um, my oldest son goes to Downers Grove North. My middle son goes to O'Neill, and my youngest son is actually a student here at Whittier. He's in fourth grade. So my middle son, Max, goes to O'Neill. Um, he's part of the BEST program. So the BEST program in our district is the behavioral, emotional, social training um, program that we have in our district. And when my son, Max, was in fourth grade, we were lucky enough to become a part of the BEST program. And around that time is when uh, myself and another parent who had a child in one of our programs um, decided that it would be beneficial to start a group that kind of links the parents with the administration so we can just have better communication and um, just sort of have a better outlet for parents as well who have children in some of our programs in the district. So we also have the DLP program, which is um, housed at Hillcrest where I work. And then we also have the RISE program. So I'll let Peggy tell you a little bit about those. Hi, I'm Peggy Delaney. I uh, have two beautiful boys in District 58. I have Charlie, who is in eighth grade at Harrod, and I have Jack, who is in sixth grade at Hillcrest, and he's in the DLP program, and Jack has uh, Down syndrome. So Jack actually started in District 58 before Charlie did, because when you are in early intervention from birth to three, uh, for children that uh, still need continued support, they start on their third birthday in the public school. So Jack began at Grove Preschool with Miss Heidel, Miss Donna Heidel, who's still here and is amazing. We're so lucky to still have her. And I'm real fortunate that for the past two years, I'm on my third year, I'm now working across the hall from Dinah, Donna in the RISE uh, program and uh, supporting uh, children in that program. So it's been an amazing journey for me now as an employee, but also for all of these years that we've been uh, supporting Jack uh, through his education journey. Uh, families that have children with special needs have a very different educational journey than parents that have only neurotypical children. We start early, we need a lot of support, we need a lot of hand-holding sometimes, and a lot of encouragement to just make sure we're doing the right thing. And we're really hoping that building bridges is just opening that door for families so that they have other families to go to that can say, it's okay. Not only is it okay, but your journey can be one of great support, great collaboration, and it can be a wonderful experience for your family and we just really want to make sure that as they step through this journey in District 58, that they understand that the path can be really, really wonderful, as it has been for both of us. So we're going to go through a few slides and, and talk just real briefly about um, how many children we're supporting in our special ed program. In District 58, we have 13.3% of our children have IEPs. That's 691 students in our, uh, our uh, District 58 right now. And another 13% on top of that have 504s. So that means that one in four of every child in our uh, District 58 programs 
receives either special education services or some sort of accommodation. It's a lot of children. And then 64% of those children spend 80% of their day in uh, gen ed programs, and another 19% spend 40 to 79%. So our gen ed students that are full-time gen ed are really spending a lot of time with our children with different individual needs. So it's really important that we collaborate really well as parents with our education teams, our resource uh, specialists, and also other parents, so that we're feeling a part of the community too. We currently have a really robust Facebook page. We would love for everyone to join the page. It's actually Building Bridges Parent Teacher Group on Facebook. We have actually had 80 families join the page since August. We are now posting every single day different things on that page local conferences and webinars and seminars that our parents can go to that will help them better care for their children. We also post a lot about District 58 and the special education programs. We've been posting about preschool screenings, ISBE resources, there's a wealth of information on their special education page, and also our special services page has a lot of information that parents could dive into about curriculum and other things. So we're wanting them to be aware of that. We've been partnering with the Downers Grove Public Library. They actually did a presentation with us in April, and we've been partnering with posting their um, Read to the Dogs and then their Sensory Sundays that open up the library an hour early for children that need um, a lower sensory experience. Uh, we are working with the fire department and the police department on helping parents register their children so, or any adults in their homes that have differing abilities, so when 911 is dispatched, they're fully aware that they're going to be entering a home that has either somebody who's wheelchair, utilizing a wheelchair, or has um, a sensory needs. And then we are also posting local events, activities for children with special needs, and resources like Start at the Arc of Illinois that offer stipends to families. So if there's a conference they want to attend, and they need financial assistance, not only will it pay for the conference, but it will also help pay for respite time, travel, hotels, and all of those things. And then also just listing awareness days to advocate for our beautiful children. Um, October is usually the month where it all happens, but there's also those special days throughout the year that we want to recognize those special days for our differing abilities. This was one of our first presentations that was done in April. We did an inclusive literature, which really went, uh, talked about positive identity images in children's literature. We did this with our liaison from the library. Um, we showcased books all the way from um, board books all the way through eighth grade literacy that helped parents identify books that um, showed positive images of people with differing abilities, but also we wanted to make sure that those books are available in gen ed classrooms and in the libraries so that siblings have access to actually reading books that showcase their unique families. It's really important that children can see themselves in literature, and this was a really well-received presentation. We had our first, um, this school year, we had our first meeting just a couple weeks ago, and we had a great turnout. Um, and this was basically um, kind of just talking about partnering with your education team. So this is for parents who are maybe just new to it, or even parents who have been you know, doing it for a while, it was just an opportunity for us to kind of give some different insight on ways that you could have a better relationship and communication with your um, child's team that you work with so closely throughout their journey. And then our, um, our next presentation is going to be in February, on February 19th, and that is going to be our parent panel. And we plan on having um, parents from all the different programs in the district kind of giving their journey and the things that they know about the program to kind of help educate those maybe who don't know or again those maybe who are just starting their journey um, in a, a specific program in the district. And then our final, um, our final program for the year will be in May. We are going to do a, um, a community resource fair and we're not sure where the location is going to be because we are still trying to get people to come and see how many we have before we commit to a location. But this will be a great resource for parents. And this, you know, can be anything from different therapies that are available, maybe different summer camps that are available and those type of things for students. So this is kind of where we're at at this point of the year. Um, we definitely also want to let everybody know that although we are focusing on a lot of the programs that we have in our district, 
this is not just limited to those parents. This is also for parents who have children with IEPs or 504s that you know maybe aren't in a program. I mean, obviously, as we showed at the beginning, we have quite a few students in our district. But this is also maybe for parents who aren't quite sure what you know what their next step is, and they just need a little bit of support. So we thank you all so much for taking the time. And if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer them. And also, like Peggy said. Everything is posted on Facebook, all of our meetings, and like she said, every day we post something that would just benefit all sorts of, you know, all sorts of abilities. So thank you again for having us. If anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. So as we move now into the curriculum workshop portion of the evening, um, a couple of goals that we're going to try to achieve tonight. The first is to take a look at the, the up, an update from each of our standing curriculum committees and see the work that has been done and look ahead to the work we intend to accomplish this year. Then we'll spend some time talking about the Every Student Succeeds Act and some preview of information there and also with the school report card. We'll talk a bit about school improvement planning in the district and then we'll certainly leave plenty of time for questions both from the board and from our audience at the end of the presentation. So with that, we'll jump right into our committee updates. We have a number of people with us tonight who are going to help speak to the work the committees are doing. As we're aware, our committees in District 58 are made up of, of teachers and administrators. Uh, the average committee size, I think, is around 32, so there are quite a, a few people working throughout these committees to make all of these wonderful things happen for our teachers and for our students. So first, I'll invite up uh, Dr. Sue Anderson and Mel Sawich to talk about the English Language Arts Committee. Hi there. Um, so starting with uh, ELA update, as I was looking back at my notes and preparing for tonight, I was looking back at all this terminology of phase one and phase two, and it's funny to know like now here we all are. So for those of you unfamiliar with those terms, um, we started all this off with uh, phase one, meaning the, in phase two was these are the two groups of teachers. We had one group of teachers who um, kind of went off and started out the resource for us to kind of get a feel for what is it like and to be that first group of teachers. Um, and then our phase, the next group of teachers was, uh, were the ones who then went through to um, learn from the first round of teachers and um, to kind of seek out you know, input from them um, so together they learn from each other along with updates from, um, of course, our resources benchmark and study things. So um, just a little background there. So phase one, phase two, that we're all in now. So uh, we're excited about that um, as far as benchmark and study things. Um, so now, you know, basically where are we at? Basically professional development. Um, last year we really did a lot of work with um, continuing to work with benchmark and study things along with, you know, learning from one another. Um, we also did a lot of work with um, talking about the scope and sequence and just kind of, you know, making recommendations of pacing guides, you know, for first trimester, second trimester. These are our goals and really reflecting on that. And even just we had a recent ELA committee just a week, I think. And um, time goes by so fast. And um, in talking during um, talking at that meeting, we talked about, you know, okay, this is the, these were the pacing recommendations. You know, how is that going? Where are we at with that? What kind of support do we need at this point? So um, it's not one of those, okay, we've, we've done the implementation, we've gotten the training. It's that ongoing um, conversation about what do we need to continue to make this be a, a positive experience for everyone. So really that kind of ties in with this is ongoing. We're going to continue to talk about this. What do we need? And um, truly it's been a, a positive experience so far from having that first round of teachers kind of go through and then get that second round of teachers through, and uh, that's where we're at now. So ELA, we're excited. Um, writing seems to be a focus for us moving forward, but um, certainly we're, we're looking forward to an excess. We call this the committee that never ends. Mm -hmm. I've been on it since 2002 in all of its different permutations, and it is a wonderful committee that works really hard and has done a ton of wonderful work. Um, our focus coming up is defining writing. Um, writing was a very big part of District 58 when I first began with this district because ISAT was testing writing. Uh, then ISAT decided that that was not going to be something that they would put um, effort towards. 
So we continued our writing instruction, obviously, um, but it wasn't as um, formal as it had been with ISAT testing, which allowed us to be a little bit more creative, um, which is always a wonderful thing when working with young children. Um, but now we need to get further into looking at the resources that we bought and spent money on, and looking at the writing um, that is in Benchmark and um, incorporated with StudySync, and kind of defining that. That's going to be our focus this year, along with grammar and vocabulary. Um, we're also looking at assessment. We know there's assessments in both of those programs, but we want to make sure that we're looking at, do we have common assessments? How are we going to have that work? How is it going to be rolled out to all the teachers? Um, and then um, we're pushing for some professional learning for writing and assessment. Um, some of us have a lot of experience with um, professional development in writing, and here in the state of Illinois, we're lucky that we have some really terrific writing um, professional development pieces that are available to us. Um, so we're looking at bringing maybe some people in or sending some of our people out. And then um, the sunset date. This committee will end at some point, and we want to decide if it's going to be at the end of this year or we need a little bit more time next fall. Um, and we're not going to end it early. Um, Justin assured us of that, as long as we have things we still need to work on. But at the same time, we're not going to make more work for ourselves. So it's been a wonderful committee. Um, we've gotten so much done with the reading piece, and now the writing piece is very exciting. So. Carrie Murphy and Karen Novak come up. And as they come up, I'll just remind everyone, each of these committees has met once during this year. So as we're reviewing the work from last year, part of the committee's first meeting is always to take a look at those goals for this coming year. So the format is kind of a look back and a look forward. And I'd like to echo what Sue said about the committee that goes on and on. I think that was math. Um, I've been on it for a little while, <laughs> but I enjoy it. Um, we have, over the past few years, really put together the math blueprint, which has been guiding our math instruction in District 58 for a number of years. Um, that is a huge document full of resources that um, have been gathered from different areas to best meet the needs of our kids, created by teachers. Um, but as we have used that, that blueprint to guide our instruction, um, we've also been finding that there's areas that we as a committee had concerns about, as especially as we were hearing from other teachers in our grade levels. Um, so we continue to have conversations about where those are, how we can fill them and best meet our students' needs, but that maybe we needed to start looking at um, a resource that had some cohesion to it um, and a new core resource for math. So that began our conversations um, last year. Uh, we started talking about wh what will we be looking for in a new resource, what do we want in a new resource. That was a big discussion right there. And then what's out there? Uh, Justin brought in a number of different uh, resources. Uh, we looked at many of them and went, uh, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> and then there were others that went, yeah, this, is, this has a possibility. So we were able to narrow, narrow, uh, narrow it down to uh, piloting um, bridges uh, and envisions pre-K through five. The um, Bridges program has a pre-K portion to it. And then in 6-8, we were uh, piloting big ideas and envisions also. Um, we are currently in the process of that. We have spent the first um, two months or so of school using uh, Bridges, and we are just at the stage where we just had the training on envisions, and we'll be starting that, and if we're not starting this week, in the next week. Um, so we are looking forward to that. Um, this also leads to a, a continual conversation within our committee about best practices in math instruction. And we need to continue to look at that as a district, as a committee, um, find resources, find speakers, find um, ways to improve our best uh, instruction in math, and find a resource that will uh, support that. That's our goal. OK, so then moving into this year, um, for 1920, we want to you know take a look at this pilot that you know um, Carrie mentioned that we are going through currently and we need to gather feedback so the committee at our last meeting was taking their time to you know go through and look at the key pieces of math instruction and you know just how we want to gather the feedback our thought is then to um, make sure that we are gathering that you know at a, in a timely manner so we want to you know, get information back from our teachers who are out in the district um, doing the pilot, this first one, uh, you know, kind of right away so it's timely and they can give that feedback. 
instead of doing it all the way at the end, both programs trying to remember back. So we will be you know, gathering feedback for our first bridges you know, at the current time, um, and then we will be in, uh, as we get further into you know, the practice and the teachers being able to utilize the Envisions program, we will be gathering feedback from them. The committee will then take a look at that feedback, and then we are hoping to make a selection of that core resource that um, we would have, and that would be, uh, you know, we would gather that so that it would, the implementation would begin in the fall of 2020. Uh, we are hoping to actually even get some student input from grades uh, six through eight to, you know, help us in our decision making. And, you know, then eventually we are going to be looking at what is our vision over time, um, you know, for math, because, you know, as Carrie mentioned, it has been an ongoing process and we would also eventually like to sunset at some point. <laughs> Um, we do want to, you know, make sure this year also after, you know, we have made some decisions in terms of resources is to take a look at math acceleration and where that's going. Um, you know, that is something that we put into place a few years back and we want to make sure that we are on the correct path uh, for our students in terms of when we start that and what that looks like. And then, of course, on the other end of the spectrum, we want to take a look at our struggling learners and make sure that they have, you know, programming and resources that will meet their needs. So, you know, these are some of the things that um, we have on our agenda for this year, and we are hoping to come back to you in January, you know, with some really good news. <laughs> so we'll see. All of our committees are working hard. It's, it's, it struck me just now that it was twel about 12 months to the day that we stood here for the first time and said, you know, the math committee feels strongly that we should pursue a new resource. And 12 months later, we're halfway through a pilot of two um, really solid resources. So it's an exciting place to be. We're well aware of the progress that our STEM committee made last year in that they were able to uh, build consensus around resources for the district. We were able to adopt a new core resource in both K-5 and 6-H listed there, the TCI and iQuest. And then we spent last, uh, a full institute day last spring as well as some time in August doing in-depth professional learning for our teachers. A lot of that was provided by the vendors, by the publishers, the people who have written the materials, which is really helpful. And all of last year was really spent in preparation for full implementation, which, as we know, has launched this fall. So I've Matt Dabala, um, who is a part of the STEM committee, is going to talk a little bit about where we're headed for this year. Hi, everyone. Um, so first piece for us is um, the ongoing professional learning. And this is um, one of those areas where our Monday um, formatting is coming in incredibly handy for us. Um, the format that we have with the combination of district time as well as teacher-directed time is giving our teachers a lot of opportunity to get together for collaboration within the building um, at the 7-8 level across the two middle schools and then especially for the sixth grade teachers to come up and get that collaboration with the uh, dedicated science teachers at the middle school level. Um, we've been using that a lot also for that reflection time for teachers to get back as they start to go through each of the units to do that timely reflection right now, um, like Karen mentioned, and not have to wait until you know December or sometime in March or April before we get a chance to come back and reflect. And then the last piece of it is especially for the sixth grade teachers, to have opportunity for them to come up and get training from the middle school science teachers on um, new activities for them. One that I would point out is the dissection piece, which sixth grade teachers really weren't familiar with doing. But we were able to, on a Monday afternoon, all the sixth grade teachers came to the middle school level and the science teachers walked through the dissection lab with the sixth grade teachers as the students. So it really helped a lot with the comfort level of sixth grade teachers going into something that they've never done before. Um, as far as the reflection and assessment of the new curriculum, um, we're doing several different things. First is really careful tracking. Um, we've made a commitment that this first year with the resources, we really want to ensure that fidelity of implementation that we're going through and teaching uh, the program as it's designed to be run. Um, we're also looking at the timing piece of it. Um, you, whenever you get a new resource, you know, it has great things laid out. This should take this long to do. One of the pieces we're doing is being very careful at monitoring, you know, as we apply it in our situation, are we able to get things done quicker? Do they take longer? How does that look? 
Um, and then the last one is looking at those adjustment pieces. Okay, we've gone through this particular unit or these lessons and, and how can we adjust them? One of the things that uh, some experience from us at the seventh grade level is the first unit that we did involved Crisco and oil. And every experiment that you did involved Crisco and oil. Um, well, those are very messy things and there was a lot of cleanup involved with that, which took significant time we weren't planning. But we've already been able to come back and with our reflection time, figure out what kind of materials we could substitute for those that'll be a little easier to manage and work with. Um, and then the final one is uh, the bottom bullet on that page about um, keeping aligned to NGSS. Um, the big change with NGSS is really that in inquiry-based science model. We did a lot of work with STEM committee to find um, content and curriculum materials that would match our vision of that. And we're very happy to say that you know, the early returns on this is it is a very different student inquiry-based model. So if you ever get a chance to come in and see our science classes, they definitely look different than they did in the past. Thanks. I'll now ask Chris Collins to come up and speak a bit about the Social Studies Committee progress throughout last school year. Thanks. So last year, the Social Studies Committee conducted a thorough review of the guiding principles in Social Studies instruction. We looked at the C3 framework, that's college, career, and civil life, as well as the Illinois Learning Standards for Social Science. Um, these standards are designed to increase rigor in civics, geography, economics, and history. Uh, we compared the Illinois Learning Standards and the C3 framework to the Illinois Learning Standards for Science, which might seem a little um, different, but we just implemented the new science standards with our new um, science program, and we wanted to see where are the things that could be similar if we're thinking about um, possibly finding different resources for teaching social studies. So where are, the, where are the areas that they line up to help our teachers as we're going through all of this change? Um, and so like science, we found that inquiry is truly at the heart of social studies instruction. The social studies standards are designed to ensure that we're helping students develop the capacity for inquiry through gathering resources, evaluating those resources, um, and then using their evidence to take action, much like all of the committees that you're hearing about today. Um, and so really inquiry is at the heart of everything um, related to those standards. So after those, we also had some discussions around current instruction in social studies. Each grade level worked to find where we are, what, where our current materials are meeting the social studies standards, the new standards, and they work to identify gaps. So where can we find the resources to meet the standards currently and where might we need some additional program resources? Um, they also discussed how teachers are addressing current events in the classrooms, both resources and practices that they're using to um, teach cur current events in their classrooms. Thank you. So as the Social Studies Committee looks forward this year, um, we are investigating additional resources and what our possible next steps would be. There's no question, there's no question that our resources are outdated. Um, and for most of our committee work, there's been a presumption that it will end in a specific resource adoption. And so to that end, we have four different vendors coming in to, pre to present some social studies materials to us on November 21st, to the committee. Social studies is a little different in that these are Illinois standards and not national standards. And so what that means from a publishing company perspective is that the alignment may not be as close as we would find it with reading and math and even science because those are driven by national standards. And so to that end, we're also going to have a team from Woodridge District 68, our neighbors, who went through this process a couple of years ago and ultimately decided not to adopt a core resource and invest their resources in that way, but to essentially build a scope and sequence and pull different resources together. Now I know in some ways that, that, that gives us pause because we've been down that road and chose to go a different direction with one of our other committees that just spoke. But um, <laughs> as, the, as the Social Studies Committee reviewed what Wood Woodridge had done, there, there was some real traction around this looks pretty cool and really might meet the needs of our kids. And so we, we've already invited them to join us, so we'll, see, we'll hear from vendors and we'll hear from a neighboring district and then have a chance to make some decisions about what our next steps are as a committee, knowing that our target is in, that in the fall of 2021, I have to always do this right, we would be adopting a new social studies 
curriculum of some sort. So that's what that means. The next committee we'll talk about began last year, um, named our Biliteracy Committee. And over the course of last year, that group worked to really build background and look at the current program, what that delivery model looked like. You'll notice right away in the slide, I, I've already done the strike through on the second time we use the word biliteracy. Biliteracy and dual language can be interchangeable, but truly the more proper term to use is a dual language program if we're going to define what our program actually is. Biliteracy is an outcome, dual language is a delivery model. And so we're working to change our language over the course of the next year and a half to use the, the, the term dual language when we talk about that program. The committee really led to a desire to explore two-way dual language, which we talked about briefly last year. Currently our program is a one-way dual language program in that the students who are eligible for the program are, are native Spanish speakers, but there are not native English speakers as a part of that program. And so a two-way program incorporates both native English and Spanish speakers. So at the end of last school year, we went and did half-day site visits at three local districts who have had two-way programs in action for a number of years and just tried to learn about what that looks like in districts that look a little bit like us. No, not that every district is, any one of those is exactly like us from a demographic standpoint. So again, that was early exploration and then our committee met this year and I'll invite Rosanna Kinyaki to come up and speak to the committee's work and goals for this school. everyone. Um, we had a productive first committee meeting where we did a thorough program needs assessment based on the um, guiding principles for dual language education, which is what schools with dual language programs use nationwide. And the committee reached a consensus um, on the next steps we need to take, which will be to define our program's mission, vision, and goals. Uh, we will also explore and consider a two-way program and what actions we would need to take if we move in that direction. Uh, we also want to continue sharing our story. One way we're doing that is through a movie project. Our first movie that we created was on Hispanic Heritage Month, where our students and staff shared their story and uh, what it means to be Hispanic to them. And we also had staff uh, from different cultures share um, their thoughts on it as well. So we look forward to continuing to tell our story, um, as well as sharing more about the committee's work and progress at our spotlight meeting in April. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now to speak to the work of our Innovative Learning and Technology Committee, uh, Mark White and Ashley Austin. Good evening, thanks for letting us be here. Um, so I've been on this committee since before the iPad's been invented, which isn't that long, actually. Um, <laughs> but there's been a tremendous amount of change with the development of the iPad, as we have known in our personal lives. Within our committee, we've introduced to our teachers the ISTE standards, which provide a framework to help our teachers guide our students through the, the, the new digital age tools and to become empowered learners, among many other things. One of the ways that we've done that is to help our teachers through the uh, Benchmark Advance Program and our ELA to uh, use the one-to-one -one devices to answer the essential question. Each of those three unique units in Benchmark has a big essential question that requires the students to become deep thinkers, synthesize what they've explored over the prior three weeks, and really come up with a succinct way to explain what they've, what they've been, been digging into. Uh, what we're doing last, we, one, nothing we did last year was to develop and pilot some of the inquiry projects within that, that same uh, Benchmark system. Those are much longer term type projects uh, that can extend over the entire three weeks or even for a, a fourth week at times um, to help those, those students dig in and to really develop how they can use those tools in the future and to help our teachers help our students do that. Uh, we additionally selected a new teacher survey that will help us identify where things are going well and where are some areas of growth for us as a committee and as a district within the use of our technology. So our steps for this upcoming year are we are continuing to develop professional learning experiences for our staff. As technology continues to change, we want to stay updated. We want to give our students the best resources and activities we can in class to help them grow as learners. And I know my fourth grade students absolutely enjoy the new technology we bring into our classroom, giving them experiences that they wouldn't be able to get just sitting in the classroom. But having that technology takes them outside of that, which is really cool to see. Um, this past 
week we had our grade level meetings where we introduced teachers to the benchmark projects that we created. So we worked in the committee with teachers. I know Mark and I worked together as a fourth and fifth grade team to develop projects. We presented them to our grade levels and our hope is to implement them within the next year. They seemed very excited about this and I know the kids find them very engaging. And finally, we are looking to select a device for a faculty refresh to keep things cohesive for our schools, keep technology continuously updating for all of us. And I know it's, it's been a while since we updated it, so we're ready for that. I know many teachers are as well. Thank you. I want to speak just a bit to the progress of the Middle School Health Committee. This is actually a very small committee of about five people, but it, it's done significant work. And so throughout the course of last year, we implemented that first year of a two-year health curriculum for our middle school students. And they, as the, there was some review and revision as part of the implementation, and while that was happening, the committee continued to meet over the course of last year to design the second year worth of that health curriculum, which we are now in the process of implementing for this year. One of the changes this year is that the health lessons are being delivered on Mondays. That was one of the considerations when we looked at the middle school schedule. Monday is obviously our shortened day. And at the middle school, we've actually, we add the SEL school-wide instruction to the morning on Monday. So the periods are shortened rather significantly. <coughs> so when our PE department was considering how they wanted to approach those 30-minute periods on Monday, which are different than 46 or 47-minute periods on the rest of the week, we, we place those health lessons on Monday. So rather than giving a condensed health instruction schedule, this year we have a model in which health instruction is being delivered weekly. So the committee is actually meeting again tomorrow to begin that revision of this year. How is that going on Mondays? What kinds of review and revision do we need to do to these lessons? And then most likely that's a committee that will sunset this year having accomplished a two-year implementation and review process of that implementation. And one of the things I want to highlight, well first I want to mention there are other committees that we're not going to hear specific updates about tonight. Those first three are really, um, they're councils, not committees. They intersect directly with curricular work, but they also, that update happens through the district leadership team and through other spotlights. But we've talked a couple different times about committees sunsetting and, and having committees that don't live forever. And part of the reason for that is that a, a good curricular review process does have to allow for some space between implementation with fidelity and then an eventual review and audit and discussion around how that's gone. And so at some point, the committee's work is actually to just let its work happen for a while and then come back around and revisit. So one of the things Curriculum Council did last year was to try to build out that long-term schedule so that we don't find ourselves in a one, two, three, four year cycle, hopefully ever again, though we need to count on the state to help us with that too. Um, and so in order to make that happen, We'll be, believe it or not, at that first moment of check-in for our, our reading, our ELA curriculum, within just a few years. And so we, we really do need that committee to finish strong and, and, and accomplish its goals that it established before those committee members will be comfortable saying, okay, we can, we can set this committee down until the next one will form. But that's where the sunset conversation is coming from. It's not, it, it isn't a lack of desire to keep going with the work because as you can see when we ask for this year's goals, there's no shortage from any of our committees. We know that there's work that we want to continue to do. Later in the year, we'll hear an update from the SEL Audit Committee. And I also wanted to highlight, last year at this time, we spoke of the Middle School Exploratory Committee, who revised many of the courses and actually added a couple of new exploratory courses. That's an example of a committee that, because of the way that group is structured and the way our Professional Learning Mondays are structured, we no longer will be meeting during the year pulling teachers out of classrooms. That committee and those, those teachers, because they comprise one full department at the middle school, can actually do the review of implementation work as part of the Professional Learning Mondays. So just one place where we've captured some additional time that we can use in a creative way. I also want to take a minute to highlight the, the new curriculum coordinator roles that we have established this year in District 58. And I've asked both Christine Priester and Matt Jewell to speak a bit to one of the specific portions of their role. Um, I know that the board has expressed interest in learning the, the uh, impact, the hopefully positive impact of having these new positions. And while we are only two and a half months in, into the full school year with these positions, I think we can point to a couple of very specific areas that have had, um, that have really benefited tremendously from these additional staff members. So I'll ask Christine to come up, Christine Priester, to talk a bit about the math pilot process and her support of that. Hello. So part of my role has been supporting the math pilot this year. So that's ranged from supporting with the logistical aspects, getting the materials in teachers' hands, and setting up 
trainings with our vendors to get that professional learning. I've also had the opportunity to meet with many teachers and observe in nearly half of our pilot classrooms, which is quite a few. And um, from that experience, I'm getting a good sense of what does the student learning environment and the student experience look like with our different resources. As we move into our second resource, I hope to observe in the other half of the pilot classrooms. Thinking um, about the rest of the year, as the committee works to make a recommendation, hopefully with one of these two resources in January, February, I hope to co-teach with many of our teachers to identify those instructional shifts that all of our teachers will have to make the next school year and then plan that professional learning. What needs to take place this school year and what will next school year professional learning look like so all teachers feel prepared, supported, and ultimately are successful in their first year of implementation. Thanks, Christine. And then Matt Jewell will come up and talk a little bit about his support of our science implementation this fall. Good evening. So as Matt uh, said, the STEM committee um, went through with uh, new curriculum materials, TCI and iQuest. So my role in at least the science area is, has a few different uh, capacities. One, I am really interested in kind of taking the STEM committee's ideas of what does good science teach, teaching look like in classrooms and kind of making sure that that's consistent and happening in the classrooms around the district. So there's that consistency and that we are being, um, we're giving science its place and it's not just part of a larger literacy effort, but it's really about helping kids think like young scientists and be involved in the actions that scientists are engaged in, um, asking questions that they are interested in and also investigating and um, then sharing their conclusions, getting feedback and making revisions. So being part of that consistency and that support for our teachers is an, an important part of my role. Um, on a practical side, with the investigations that our new materials um, kind of help us with, it's a lot of supplies. So part of my effort is to make sure that that goes more smoothly and that teachers and students have those things that they need. Um, and that also means kind of building those communication channels between grade level teams in different buildings across the district so that we're kind of sharing the knowledge and not recreating things that we don't need to. So building that kind of capacity within our uh, teams, within different buildings and grade level teams is really important. Um, also with implementation, as Matt said, we have to get a lot of feedback throughout the process so that we can see where we may need to supplement, um, where we can also take care of any professional development needs that staff might have. And how we need to revise or improve um, the materials themselves. So finally, I think my role, especially in relation uh, to our strategic plan, is to make sure that we're telling our story. Because there's a lot of great work being done in science in our district. Um, and I want the families and in the wider community of Donners Grove to have kind of a window into those classrooms. I think it was the third or fourth week of August that a, an email chain came across my screen and before I had had a chance to fully read it and it was about curriculum and implementation, it had been answered and, and I think I actually heard angels sing. It was really kind of <laughs> cool. But, <laughs> but kidding aside, it, it's not just about being able to delegate and separate some of the work. It's about the collaboration that exists between the three of us. It's about having a, a, a curriculum department that meets regularly and I really do think that we are, we are at the very surface of the impact that these roles will have. Um, obviously, we've tried to do some specific delineation, but we're really all talking about all of it and continuing to work on what that will look like for the rest of the year. So I, I remain grateful to the board for your support in, in including these roles in our overall picture. And I'm grateful to Christine and Matt for the work that they've already done for our district. So that takes us to the end to kind of pause point number one um, of two. But <laughs> just to ask about if there, is a, if there are any questions about the committee work specifically before I, I allow and, and encourage some of our presenters this evening to go ahead and get rested for tomorrow's students that are coming their way. So are there any questions that I can answer for the board specific to the committee work so far? Um, this is related to the math pilot and rollout. I know that there was some discussion on social media um, from 
some parents that maybe needed a little bit of explanation about the math pilot and the rollout. And I didn't know if there's if, there, if you could speak to that. I know that there's a decision potentially in the pipeline come the spring. I forget what the date was, but sure. um, once there's a decision by the math committee to move forward with A or B, it, the question from some of the parents was about what happens for the rest of the year. So for the pilot classroom could, specifically? For what? For the pilot classroom specifically? Yes. Yeah. So the, the timeline is January we'll report to the board about all of our progress up to that point. That's the spotlight. Two days after the spotlight, the committee will convene to really start to build consensus, hopefully, around a resource. So our, our hope, our target for a recommendation to the board is actually the February meeting. We would build all the background of our process in January, ask those questions, and then hopefully simply come back with a, look, we made a decision as a committee about a recommendation. Or in, in the unlikely event that we don't reach consensus, then we've made a decision as a committee to do X, Y, or Z. Um, so the pilot experience will be wrapped up by winter break, essentially, so that we can have time to synthesize that feedback and have those conversations. It's difficult to say, then, what's next for those pilot classrooms. The instructions we've given is to be ready to go back to our current blueprint, because really our obligation over the course of that one year is to make sure that all of the standards are met for those students in each grade level. At the point where the committee makes a decision, we can then make a secondary decision as to, okay, does it make sense to continue on with the pilot resources or does it make sense to wait until we get even richer training? Because the other thing to recognize is that the, the, the pilot teachers have had a half day of training for each resource, which is a lot, but the recommendation for full implementation is at least a day and a half of that same training. And so those are the conversations we'll have as a committee. I'm, I'm confident that some of our committee members would be eager to continue down the road of whichever resource we pilot, but it's something we'll need to talk about as a committee before we can make that final decision. So the real answer to that question is I don't have an answer to that question yet, but we will as soon as we get to that point of the committee work. Okay, I appreciate it. Anything can else? Ask, can I ask a question about the science? First of all, uh, the committee's work uh, for every committee is just amazing. Um, the, the wealth of investment, the wealth of impact that you all are having is uh, very impressive, um, and so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, a uh, question on the science curriculum uh, committee. Uh, this is near and dear to my heart from my day job, and so when thinking about implementation fidelity, uh, that's very difficult to do as a district as large as ours, and so uh, I've heard of implementation thought of as a fidelity question or an integrity question, meaning we're gonna look at the outcomes and less look, look less at the activities happening in a particular class. Uh, I'd love to just get your thoughts on how are you thinking about fidelity um, in and looking at what, what's happening in classrooms and how do, you, how do you go about doing that? So there's a number of ways to approach it. One of the things that we just did with our K-6 teachers, you heard a couple of people reference grade level meetings. So last week we had each grade level together for half a day. And we have similar times like that on the Mondays where we certainly, where at different times we have all of the first grade teachers, fifth grade teachers. Part of that fidelity process is just giving teachers space to talk through, are we doing this? and who's doing it this way and what have we found, kind of as has been alluded to in a couple of ways, to, to really encourage each other to keep on that path. Our, our sixth grade teachers acknowledge that the, the next unit they're about to encounter beginning in around December is gonna require a significant amount of prep just in terms of, of materials that if you, if you are a day ahead, you will turn a page and realize you are two weeks behind in terms of preparation that you were supposed to have done. Mm -hmm. And so in acknowledging that, because some of our pilot teachers have looked ahead, we're setting aside time on one of the Mondays in December for all of the sixth grade teachers to literally just unpack that unit collectively and talk through what's happening. So part of it is, is finding the time and, and, and energy to support implementation with fidelity. Then the accountability piece does come, again, it'll be, it will be administrative walkthroughs and conversations and things like that. It'll also be those same conversations in April and May. How far did we get? Where are we? I think one of the things that I'm proud of is that in the past couple of years, we've really become very comfortable saying, well, right now I'm in week three of unit two in, in, in whichever resource we're implementing. We had that conversation around ELA instruction at all the grade level meetings as well. We know what our target is. Let's talk about where we are. And if we're not there, then let's talk about what are the roadblocks and what might be stopping us from getting there. So that's, that's one piece of, of the fidelity part. Again, I think the other thing is, is part of what Mr. Dabala mentioned in terms of ensuring that we are continuing to stay true to the NGSS piece of any resource and making sure that we are seeing that our students are doing science instead of reading about science or looking at science, but they're truly engaged. And I think 
if you, if you start to watch some of the, the pictures that are coming through, dissection was mentioned, and I, I can't wait to find the opportunity to show you the number of slideshows and videos we have of the, of the smiles on kids' faces as, as they are cutting into these disgusting lamprey and, <laughs> and, and how, but how engaged they are. And, and teachers who just weren't sure about it, who are just writing and saying, I, okay, I, I, I took a risk and I tried this and wow, is it working for the kids. So that is also a way that just, just seeing the evidence physically of the hands-on approach. I have another question with ELA. Um, when Sue Anderson was talking about focusing on um, the writing and curriculum expectations, is that um, as part of like benchmark, benchmark advance and study sync and stuff, is this to look and explore whether there needs to be like a scope and sequence or a, like ancil, um, extra writing that isn't provided in benchmark and because the focus was for uh, several years because I'm an eighth grader and a sixth grader was not so much writing. And so is that, is that to try to address that, to maybe beef that up a little bit? Yes, to, to some degree. To be fair, we, I, I want to make sure we're careful. There has been writing instruction every right. year in every classroom. Right. Have we had a comprehensive writing approach across the district? Probably not in the past few years. And so both Benchmark and Study Sync do have a, a, a pretty robust writing component. When we initially implemented, we focused heavily on reading. and We wanted to make sure that the reading side of both resources was explored fully. And the way we approached that was we kind of said, okay, we're going to just use everything that's there and then try to decide, yes, are there, are there gaps? Do we need to fill those gaps? We are now at the point where, we're, where we've implemented reading to, the, to a, a strong degree. We're comfortable with that. So now we're doing the same thing with the writing side of both resources. We're really looking deeply at what's there. Is this, how we, is, is this best practice in writing? Is this enough? And then once the committee sort of makes that decision, which will happen middle to the late of this year, then we have to figure out what is the professional learning plan so that everyone is able to access all of these writing materials or all of these other writing materials if it comes down to that, but again, with fidelity so that we have a consistent writing instruction platform to point to in district. Oh, so it is part of those? Of there is, yes, there is, I mean, we, we, we very well could say we are going to use Benchmark and Study Sync as our core writing instruction component. That could very well be an outcome of the committee's work. We okay. have not, we're still working to clearly articulate that. Um, you know, reading and writing in many cases are two separate curricula. We're fortunate to have resources that could blend them, and so that's what we're working on right now. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask. I do reading. No, go for it. Um, mine is not so much committee specific, but kind of more big picture. You talked a little bit about committees, you know, thinking about sunsetting and um, kind of the idea that obviously, hopefully, we're looking forward to not having a one, two, three, four type of cycle take place again. So, has the curriculum team? made a, a kind of more of a concrete plan of thinking, okay, if, you know, ELA, we've been in ELA for two years now, we're going to keep working with it for two or three more years, and then we're going to look back again. Have, do you have a, a solid concrete plan in mind for all curriculum as you cycle through the updates and the adoptions as to when you will look back at each one to say, where are we at? Do we need to revisit? Do we need to change so that we don't end up in that kind of a process again? We actually do. That was, the, that was the work of the Curriculum Council last year to build it, and this year at their first meeting just a, a couple few weeks ago, we kind of, we, we reached consensus on, yes, this is the plan we're going to present. So as part of the district leadership, leadership team update in a couple of months, mm -hmm. that will be one of the things that we'll share as a tangible outcome of the Curriculum Council and really checking one of those completed boxes in one of the objectives that we have in goal one. So yes, we do have that, mm -hmm. and it's, and again, it's, Nothing is perfect because you have to allow for fluidity in sure. terms of what the decisions are at different points, but we definitely have a start down that road to, to ensure that we space things out manageably. A couple of committees brought up the one-to-one uh, -one tie in to the program. Um, and uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of when we're talking about technology from the perspective of we're trying to teach technology standards but not independent of others, but we're trying to do it in conjunction with. And so when we think about uh, math resources that are being evaluated now, resources uh, for social studies and otherwise that might be evaluated in the future, how are we tying in technology standards into the uh, evaluation of our current resources that we're testing? So I can tell you that as part of that survey that was mentioned in the math committee, one of the eight components that are being uh, analyzed and that we're soliciting feedback upon is the technology component specifically. 
in terms of what resources are available, how accessible are they, how well do they, ta do they tie in. I can also tell you that really going forward, we're, I can't think of a scenario where we're pursuing a resource or where we would that didn't relate and interact with our one-to-one -one platform. I think that that's just part of, of who we are, and so we are seeing that connection through all of the resources. But we are, that is a specific area that we're looking for connections, again, not just in is there an online component, but is that online component student friendly? Does it actually does it actually help us as opposed to just being a PDF version of the workbook, which yeah. is pretty much table stakes at this point? Thank you. Right. Thanks. I'll move on to the next portion of the presentation. And again, I, this is my public moment of saying thank you very much for presenting. I really appreciate that. And if you should choose to move on, you've all actually seen most of this next part. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very thank much. You. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. So a lot of what's in the next set of slides is sourced directly from the Illinois State Board of Education, or ISBE, as we'll refer to it a little bit. Um, and much of this is information that's been before the board previously, but as this will be a topic of conversation in our community over the next couple of months, I wanted to make sure that we had some background. So what we're speaking of is the Every Student Succeeds Act, and specifically Illinois' plan to meet the federal requirements. Again, this is federal legislation. This replaced No Child Left Behind that requires each state to develop a plan in order to access federal grant money that flows through the state that flows to the district. So this is essentially an accountability piece that reaches up to the federal level. This is our second year in this plan, and really the, the focus by the authors and by everyone who talks about ESSA is that it's designed to be a plan that identifies the need for support and helps to funnel support in that direction. Its intent by design is not to be punitive, is not to be anything other than a vehicle to identify support. We remember that each school through the ESSA plan receives a designation. And so there are four tiers of designation. Tier one is a school that has no underperforming subgroups and then whose performance is in the top 10% of schools statewide. Tier two are commendable schools, which is a school that meets all those same requirements but simply isn't in the top 10%. And then a tier three school is a school in which a subgroup, one or more subgroups are performing um, below a particular threshold in the state, and then therefore, if any group is designated as underperforming, the entire school is. Tier four are the lowest performing 5% of Title I school, of, uh, of schools in Illinois. And so, again, that, that tier one and tier two designation is, is essentially the same, the outcomes are the same. The difference is that the plan, for whatever reason, draws a line each year at the top 10% to, to make that designation. The, there's no additional funding, there's no additional anything other than the designation of exemplary versus commendable. When we talk about those demographic groups, again, any of our schools who have 20 or more students who fall into one of these categories listed on the screen um, that have data in enough specific areas are counted as, as part, as a subgroup for that year. And when I say that have data in enough specific areas, there are times when there, there may be one of the, the things on the next slide that doesn't exist, which might mean we could have 25 students that fit a category, but through for the purposes of ESSA, they aren't then identified as a subgroup. ESSA designations are built on two sets of indicators. The first side is the academic side, which in, it, in, in aggregate makes up 75% of the weight. And so these are those items, ELA proficiency, math proficiency, science proficiency, which is new this year. English learner progress to proficiency, and then growth for ELA and math. Obviously, we don't have high school graduation rate. The other 25% are student success indicators for this year for us. That's chronic absenteeism and the climate survey, which is simply the participation in the climate survey. It has nothing to do with the results. If we have 90% of, 95%, excuse me, of students at a school participate in the climate survey, then we receive full credit for that. You'll notice here there are still some grayed out areas. Those are indicators that are in the legislation, but not yet in the accountability because the state hasn't quite figured out how they want to define or measure those things. So for this year, our pie chart looks like this. And this is what makes up our ESSA designation. You can see that growth, obviously, is 50%, which is a good thing. We want to see students grow. That's, that's, a, that's a good measure to use. Proficiency is a decent column there. That absenteeism piece is a decent number on that side, and then the, the climate survey is there. So you can kind of see, this is the slide to go back to when, you're, when we get real numbers and we're looking at those kinds of things to say, okay, how did this weight work out for us? Um, remembering that all of this, when we talk about proficiency or growth, is based exclusively on the state-mandated assessment, right? So that's 
the Illinois Assessment of Readiness, which replaced PARC, the Dynamic Learning Map, which is for that, that same assessment for students who um, are eligible for that assessment based upon their IEP. And then this year for science, it's the Illinois Science Assessment, which is given only to students in fifth and eighth grade. So that 5% of the pie chart hinges on one test one day for our fifth graders or our eighth graders in those buildings. The other thing we have to talk about tonight is the data embargo. So in years past, the data has always been embargoed until late in October. In years past, we've used this moment to talk about the actual numbers and in, in, with the thinking being we wanted to give our board and our, our engaged members of our community a chance to wrap their heads around some of this before it becomes public and lands, you know, that, that you will see that typically in the Tribune and, and social media will pick up some of these things. This year, ISBE has been very explicit with their embargo language and has specifically included Board of Education meetings, any public meeting, any place that is in a public presentation. We are just, and, and after reading that language, we as an administrative team we felt like we, we needed to change our past practice. It was language we hadn't seen come out of the state before and, and so we're going to honor that. So what that means is we've been able to have internal conversations. So for our staff, our, with, our, with our administrative team, and even in some of our building faculties, we have had some conversations where we've shown them some, some real numbers so that our principals and our teachers have a chance to, again, have some understanding of what this will look like. We're two days away, um, and so we'll, we'll talk about what our, our presentation plan will be. So tonight, I want to give you all of the background on how these scores are derived, and then in a couple of days, you'll receive, just as everyone else does, the information on what the actual numbers are for all of our first Again, remembering that when we talk about proficiency, that means on the IAR, it's a level four or five out of a five-point scale. So students receive either a one, two, three, four, or five. For the Illinois Science Assessment, it is literally not proficient or proficient. That are, those are the only categories given for that assessment. <coughs> so again, just to recall how these things are calculated. So proficiency is calculated against an established target. So again, I always point to the very bottom here where all of these numbers are 90. So ESSA says that by the year 2032, every student and all subgroups, 90% must meet and exceed state targets. We'll see if we get there, but that's the target the legislation sets for. And so what they've done then is started with the 2017 actual scores for all students on that far left column up here, and then each subgroup going across, and ratcheted down to get to 90% in the end. So in 2019, the all student number is 46.38. So that means that the state threshold for ELA proficiency is 46.38% of students meeting or exceeding. That means get, achieving a four or a five on the Illinois Assessment of Readiness. So if we achieve that number, then we get full credit for that piece of the pie chart. And if we are below that number as an individual school, then we receive proportional credit for that part of the pie chart based upon where our actual score is. Okay? That's, it gets a little complicated, but that's the idea. We'll just focus on the all student group. So the same thing for math, if we look at the all student, if we look at the all student group 2019, for math that number is 42.58. So if more than 42.58% or greater of the students in an individual building uh, achieve proficiency on the IAR for math, then we meet the state threshold and gain the full credit for the designation. Similarly with science, the number happens to be a little higher. It's 57.78% proficient in 2019. Growth is actually a, a complicated calculation, but essentially um, it, it's, it's an average of each individual student's growth percentile. So each year for each student, they calculate an individual growth percentile. And the way they do that is by comparing that student to all of the other students who began at the same point. So the example I typically use is if I score a 700 on the IAR last year, I am going to be compared this year to all of the other students who began at 700. So if I scored a 750 next year, and the majority of those students who started at 700 score a 725, my growth percentile is going to be rather high because I outpaced the growth of the majority. But if I score a 750 and the majority of those students who started at 700 with me score a 775, my growth percentile will be on the lower end of things because they outpaced my growth. So it's comparing, you know, we, we talk about MAP growth a lot, and MAP compares to a national norm. So that number never changes. If you started at 232, you are, predicted, you are projected to score a 235 at, an, at the next interval. This growth measure changes year to year because it's based on the actual student scores in a given year. Chronic absenteeism is straightforward. It is literally the number of students who are absent 10% or, 10 or more of school days divided by the number of students you have in the school. 
Um, it only excludes medically homebound or hospitalization. Um, it does, one thing that has come up in a couple of conversations, you do have to be um, enrolled for 134 days to be counted as part of that. So you have to be part of, of an individual school for 134 consecutive days. The final calculations bring everything down basically from all of this raw data through a couple of different formulas into that pie chart. So everything comes down to out of 100. So what that looks like for an individual school, I know this one's small, but each school receives a report that has the all student group at the top and then any subgroups below it, and it goes through all of them. So to look more directly, and these are still small, but a little readable. So the top uh, row is that raw data that comes through. The middle row is the indicator score, which has to do with the calculation, and then the bottom row is where we look across where it says weighted index. That brings us to out of 100 at the far right. And so, for example, in this case, this school, if you look at their ELA proficiency, this fake school, they, that was at 49.14. So it was above the state threshold. They received full credit in that particular column. Then you can see where their growth percentile was at the top row and what that meant in terms of bringing it down to a scale score. Their math proficiency at 36 was below the state threshold, so they didn't receive the full credit. They, receive, they received 6.79 points out of a possible, in this case, 8.04. Let me pause. If you go back to the pie chart, it says that it's 7.5%. But there's an indicator missing. That EL progress to proficiency in this example is not present because that school did not have a, enough, a, a subgroup to warrant that metric being used. So that means that that 5%, just to make sure it's not super careful and easy to read, that 5% is redistributed over everything to the left of it. So where ELA proficiency is actually worth 7.5% of the pie, when you redistribute that other 5%, it becomes 8.04% possible. When we do the, the public face of this, we have slides that really, we will break this down as clearly as possible. But that's essentially how the math works, walking all the way across to that summative score. So right here in this, in this final column, that 73.79 is the final, the final score out of 100 that this fake school receives. And then, <laughs> if he takes that list, they, rank, they literally just stack it and rank top to bottom. They draw that relatively arbitrary 10% line, and we decide that everybody above that this year is exemplary, everybody below that this year is either commendable or otherwise, depending on your subgroups. And they release those designations in just a couple of days. So that's where all of that goes for us. Another thing I'm just gonna continue to point out is that when you look at what happens, if you're a tier four school, you have to go through a support process. If you're a tier three school, you have support available. Both of those, those schools actually have additional funding available as well. If you're a tier two or a tier one school, the output is exactly the same. There is, no, there is no difference between being a tier one school and a tier two school in the eyes of the state other than where you fall proportionate to that, proportional to that line that's drawn each year. So what are we gonna do with this? Um, principals have had a chance to look over this data for a little bit of, a, a little bit of time. Uh, some principals have chosen to use faculty meeting time already to talk through this. Others are planning to do so in the very near future. On Wednesday at noon, um, report cards will become publicly available. It's our hope to get those up on the district website as soon as we possibly can. Um, when we talk about report cards a little later, we'll talk more about this, but essentially we're still, we still don't have from ISB even what we had last year at this time. So we're working through some, some frustration in terms of being able to predict what some of this is gonna look like in it when it's public facing in just a couple of days. Um, but the other thing that'll happen is each principal, and we did this last year, will send a letter to their parent community and staff informing them of the designation relative to ESSA. And then we've scheduled a parent forum for each school uh, in the evening, many of them tied to PTA events. Not all of them are able to be that way. So throughout the month of November, I will co-host a forum at each school with the building administration and we'll talk about all things at that building, all different pieces of data, but also talking specifically about the designations that are there and what that means, and frankly, why we're incredibly proud of all 13 of our schools, and also what the data can tell us and what next steps there can be. Last year, we had 11 exemplary schools and two commendable schools. If you go back in time a little bit, it was two years ago that I stood here and said, we really need to change our focus on PARC. We really need to take a moment and think about how we've been approaching the assessment and, and put a little bit more of our energy toward it, 
and ensure that, that our community and our students and everyone's approaching it with the same fidelity, the same intensity, the same um, appropriate level of, of intensity that we approach every other assessment. And so from spring of 17 to spring of 18, we recognize as a district, you'll recall, some significant growth in our, in our park scores. We saw achievement across the board jump up about 9%. 9% more of our students on the whole as a district were meeting and exceeding expectations. So we captured a year of what is probably atypical growth because of that shift. This year, what we, what we are recognizing, and again, I can't get into specific numbers, but I think what we're recognizing is a year of more typical growth, which we're still very proud of, but it's not gonna pace that same jump we saw between 17 and 18. And so when you think about the percentage of growth that's factored into that pie chart at 50%, we, we may see some differences than we saw last year. But again, the, the thing we have to focus on is that, that line that's drawn by the state moves every year. And what's unfortunate is the state also doesn't give us a, how far are you from that line? It's just a piece that they chose to put that 10% number in. So part of these parent forums are going to be to make sure that we have a chance to talk about what that really means and how proud we are of the continued achievement and growth we see in all of our students while looking at next steps with the grade. So I'll pause there for a second and ask if there are any questions that I actually can answer before Wednesday about the, uh, the ESSA designations and those pieces. I have one. Um, you mentioned about the, the growth percentile, and you used your example by at a 700 and the next year 750, et cetera. Um, you talked about comparing to, like, take your growth compared to the other kids who started at the 700 as well. Are you talking about comparing statewide or within the district when you're comparing to other kids who also had the 700? Statewide, everyone okay. who took the assessment. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty good sample size. And, and honestly, it's a pretty fair metric at the end of the day. So yep. since last year was the first year that they kind of did all, right? And so did the outcome with all the schools getting all their designations and the rollout of whatever funding they're supposed to get or services, did that all work out okay in the big picture as I, far as the state is concerned? I'm not going to hazard an answer to that question <laughs> because, because <laughs> be, you know, I, I mean, because truly, because I think, if you were fair, any program in a first year, it's difficult. Right. I can tell you that when, when we attend conferences, the, there is definitely a lot of conversation around how to access that support, the kinds of supports that exist for the schools who are designated tier, tier three and tier four, to the point where there are moments when, when you know, looking at last year, where I would be at those conferences and run out of sessions to go to because we weren't tier three or tier four. You know, so at the state level, all I can speak to is what I've seen, which is that there, there is a significant emphasis on ways to access, ways to use that funding, the kinds of organizations that are there to support the schools. Justin, when you talk about the funding for the three and four schools, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that there's some sort of rules on how schools are allowed to use that funding. Can you yes. talk, I'm just out of curiosity, how does that work? Simil it's similar to the way we're able to use title funds in general, so there, there, there needs to be an accountability piece. It really, is, it really is focused on improving student achievement. So mm -hmm. whatever you use those funds for has to, has to focus on you have to be able to demonstrate that you are expecting an outcome that will raise student achievement mm -hmm. through the course of that. So sometimes it's staff, sometimes it's resources, sometimes it's very specific programming, depending on what the funding is, and, and in any given district, how many schools have those funds available to them. And just to, to piggyback off of that, mm -hmm. one of the things that the state has set up is this network called Illinois Empower. And so if you are in uh, Tier 3 and Tier 4, um, and you are choosing to use the funds in Tier 3 or required to use the tier funds or, or the funds in Tier 4, you have to partner with an Illinois Empower provider. Um, some of those are school districts, uh, some of those are ROE. So for example, DuPage is an Illinois uh, Empower provider. And while we're not um, in that boat this year, you could potentially be in that boat with a subgroup. Um, and so if we were in that as a school district, we would obviously take those funds and then partner with an Illinois uh, Empower. But just as Justin said, there are pretty rigorous rules in terms of what you can do with that provider, most of which I've seen centered on the school improvement process and, and really making that more robust to improve a subgroup who's unperforming. Uh, but it wouldn't be uncommon for a district like ours, again, we're not in that boat this year without giving away too much uh, in information, um, to have one school be in that particular subgroup uh, mm -hmm. where they fall into a, a you know, needs improvement mm -hmm. or underperforming. I'll just, uh, this is more of a comment, less of a question. Last year, Justin, you shared that uh, we had these ratings by school 
And uh, one of the things I appreciated from you is not to get too excited and not too down because it is just one other data point among the data points that we have available to us. Um, and I would just ask us as a board to do the same thing again to follow your lead, Justin. And whatever the ratings end up being for on Wednesday, uh, it is just, and again, another data point for us to continue to react to, but not to overreact to. And so I appreciate your leadership there and just wanted to make sure that we remind ourselves for that too. Correct. And um, my, my two cents is, we all, I mean, I, I, I agree with what Karachi said. Um, my thought was, you know, we don't want to sit there and, and admire the, uh, the designations. We don't want to pat ourselves on the back and, and say, you know, mission accomplished if we're exemplary. We don't want to, to necessarily fret um, unnecessarily if we're commendable. Um, but with each building, with each designation, whatever you get, there, there should be some, some analysis of data that tells us not only how we're doing overall, but how our subgroups are doing so that there's lessons to take from from all of them, and so that we're, all, we're we're just constantly improving. So let's say we have we have a building that's exemplary. Our our all group is above the 90% threshold, but we have maybe some some subgroups that are down a little bit, but they have not enough to drag our average down, obviously. But we should just, just want to make sure that we're paying attention to all of our students to make sure that, that there's there's that equity and the, the the quality of education we're providing to all of our students. No, I appreciate that, and that really is a piece of ESSA that has caused us to look inward a little bit more. And you'll even see the two of our six KPIs focus on subgroups as well, you know, when we look at the strategic plan. So that's, been a, that's a piece we do want to keep in mind. Yeah, Karat, I, I really appreciate what you said, and I would echo what Justin has said many times. The schools, October 30th at 1201, are the same schools that you would see today on October 26th at 801. Um, so I think we always have to remember, and just what you said, Greg, is wherever we're at in that moment with whatever indicator we get, how are we using that data to constantly improve through the school improvement process? And that's what our focus is always going to remain as a school district is, Data in, data out, how do we use that no matter what the ranking is to constantly get better. Justin, do you have any insight uh, into why absenteeism is such a large portion? That seems like kind of an outlier piece, and I'm just curious as to have you heard anything about that? I mean, in, yes, in the, you know, in, in the most simple take on it, you need to be in school to, to grow and achieve. Sure, but the well, school, school can't control necessarily. That, that, is, that is true in, in many ways. And I think in our community, the, the kind of chronic, we, when we look at chronic absenteeism, when we look at really what brings students over that 10%, it's a number of things, but, but it, it, it looks a lot more like planned vacations combined with some absences than it does with school, like, than it looks like school refusal or some of the other factors that contribute to absenteeism. Part of the reason it's such a big part of the plan is that when you look at the numbers statewide, there are districts who are dealing with 50, 60, 70 percent of their students who are falling into this category. Mm -hmm. So we are in, in single digits in most cases, sure. and so it looks a little different for us. So actually, on the one hand, for us, that's a, it's, a, it's, it's a nice <laughs> metric to have because mm -hmm. we tend to do well compared to the state. There are really, I was shocked when I to learn some of the numbers that districts, not all that far from us, and, and not just the ones you would automatically think of and point to as troubled districts, mm -hmm. the, the, the numbers of some of those chronic absentee uh, statistics. Is there like suggestions for schools into how to improve that, like from a school's point of view? Yeah, I mean, I think that, in, again, I'll speak to what, what we're looking at. I think what, what, what we try to do is make sure that, that our parent community is informed, that you're aware that those choices can have an impact on the school. In, in the same way that we had a conversation around you know, the, the actual taking of the, of the park assessment a couple of years ago. Like we want people to just be aware of what the impact of those choices are. I, I'm also not going to stand in front of an asthmatic student and say, nope, you need to stick around because that's your 17th day. Like I don't mm -hmm. think that's who we want to be. <laughs> and, so, I, and so really, and so I think that's, for us, we're fortunate to be in a position yeah. where we want to be able to talk about it. We want to encourage attendance, certainly. And, and in the pockets where we find it to be, more of a school refusal or, or a situation where there are other things at play, mm -hmm. I think our, our social workers and, our, and our, our counselors at the middle school do a really nice job of working specifically with those individual situations. Thank you. Quick question for you, and we kind of had a conversation about this before, but um, the, the metric I'm kind of curious about, because it's not something that's specifically looked at, like how often do we evaluate sort of the progress of the kids that have been going through the plans throughout our district as opposed to the ones that, that kind of come in and get transplanted and they, they come in as a fourth grader or a sixth grader and you know are sort of looking at that differentiation as well. 
you can make the honest answer to your question is not a whole lot. We, we, don't, we don't break down data. We haven't broken down data in that way very often. I think the, the conversations that you might hear at buildings are a little more anecdotal. I think what we can look to is, you know, when we look at, at, at how our achievement looks, when we use our map data, looks comparative to national norms, we continue the, 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 grade, the higher the student grade, we continue to, say, to see further separation from the national averages. So that can imply, at the very least, that, our, that the longer a student is with us, the, the more we're seeing in terms of growth and achievement. But to, to be perfectly honest, we haven't necessarily looked at, we haven't necessarily put number of years in District 58 against sixth grade performance data. But it's something we certainly can if, it, if, it's, you know, if it's something that people, that we want to take a closer look at. You know, I, I ask more, I, in, I ended up engaged in a conversation with a, with a district that has a, a problem with a lot of, a lot of change, you know, with people moving in and out. And, uh, and when I was talking with a teacher from there, they were talking about the drastic difference they see with the kids that kind of stay on their track and how well, how strongly performing they are, but they're a, they tend to be a weaker district in general. And so I, it, this is not something I necessarily hear from our district, but they were talking a lot about that metric. And I was, I was curious if that was something that ever came up or that we thought about here, or if it wasn't really anything that was on a radar. I think that's fine, too. But yeah, I I, the, the truth is that our overall mobility rate is not something that we would, that, would that, that number is not something as a district that would necessarily cause us to want to invest a lot of energy in figuring that out. However, that number does vary by school, just like everything else does in our community. Right. So we do have a couple of schools that have a higher mobility rate, kids in and out in a given year, than others. And so that may be a place to, to think about how that factors in. Yeah. It's all part of telling our story. Now one of the things in, in terms of school transition, um, the research would show that every time a student moves during the school year, they tend to fall about six months behind. I, and so when you see that you know, over and over again, I think that's a struggle that many districts do have with a high mobility rate, is they're doing a great job once they get the students there. It's keeping them there into the system which is why we're one of the, the big proponents of switching from just a, a flat out achievement score to measuring growth because I think many educators will say, judge me based on the time I had with the student versus what may or may not have happened um, in the past. I think another uh, important note for the board is when we look at the IAR, we do not count scores for students if they moved into the district after May 1st or if they moved into your school after May 1st. So for instance, if a child uh, you know, just came from a different school district after May 1st, they wouldn't count for the district or the school. If we had a child transfer um, from, let's say, Whittier to Kingsley, they would count for the district, but they wouldn't count for Kingsley until after they get that. So the state does provide a little bit of uh, a kind of a buffer for uh, transfer students, but once they're in your system for a year or in that school for a year, then they do count towards your um, overall score. One other quick question. If, um, for students who are in um, special education programs like DLP or BEST or RISE, um, do their scores count towards the school where that program is housed? Like my son in BEST, his score count towards his overall, their overall score. How does that typically work? So we, we, look, we look carefully at this every year because things appear in different reports in a different way. Mm -hmm. My understanding from the most recent ISB guidance is that they are now, for the, for the summative designations, they are looking at serving school. So that is, that is where students are being, are being assigned in those cases. Mm -hmm. We will double. Um, we can, yeah, we yeah, can, I mean. That, that does change, so we'll double check and give okay. the board, uh, you know, the full answer. But, but Justin is right. They, they've changed that numerous times. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be that way, then they changed it back, but we'll double and triple check that. Just. I want to just take a moment to talk about our, our school improvement planning and just a little bit of preview around a couple new elements that we're told will be a part of the school report card. Um, first, to talk about our, our, our school improvement planning. Again, this happens annually in all buildings. There's a review of data. We look at performance data. We look at environment data. And then we, our template asks each building to set goals in three areas. And uh, this year, we, we made it deliberate. We made a deliberate change to the template and really wanted to make sure we were aligning with both the key performance indicators in the strategic plan as well as our new strategic plan and the goals that were encompassed therein. And then obviously, we're going to identify specific action steps. So the template looks like this. And again, I know this gets difficult to read, but the, the, the light blue highlight on the upper left, basically these for our achievement goals, which typically are one in reading and one in math, asks a school team to take a look at those six KPIs and choose the one that they're going to align to and then develop a specific stand, a specific goal, and then a number of what we call process targets or things that they're actual tangible steps that we're going to take 
to achieve that goal. So each school looks at their own data and makes a determination around what is our achievement goal going to be in reading, that's one goal typically, and then what is our achievement goal going to be in math. The third goal this year is a communication goal. It's part of our strategic plan and something we've been focusing on, uh, so it, it made good sense to, to make that part of each school's improvement process. So each school also has identified, tied to objective 2.2 in the strategic plan, uh, a communication goal. Because of this new template and some of these new pieces, we're still uh, we're working on a couple of finishing formatting touches. So the board will have these before them um, this, at the end of this week for your review. Um, and then you'll hear, you've actually already heard some of the reporting out on some of these goals when we had Whittier and, and um, Henry Puffer speak to do the, the sort of the flag salute and all of that. We're working to incorporate not just a, a particular highlight that might be exciting for that building, but also really how it connects back to some of these goals, whether it's communication or whether it's achievement. So each month, you'll hear some specifics from each of our schools as to how they're working toward these goals. The school report cards, again, are the other thing that becomes public on Monday at noon. There's three versions. There's an interactive online version, which also contains sort of an at-a-glance and then there's also the classic sort of multi-page PDF that we've become used to seeing. And again, I would love to show you a sample of what that's going to look like this year, but we, we just aren't, we haven't gained access. And, and actually, Kevin was on the phone this morning with ISB trying to see if we could get what we have been, what has been promised to all districts. And apparently, it's just, it's just not coming to anyone until Wednesday. So what that means is we may not get those report cards published on our website right away on Wednesday. We're going to do it as fast as we can, but we haven't even had a chance to review the format. And, and the reason I'm, I'm anxious a bit about that is because there's going to be new data on those report cards. One is the science proficiency, which we have those numbers, so we're, we're anticipating that. Another piece is the site-based expenditure reporting, which is not a curriculum lane, but I can, I can go a little bit into it. Um, one of the requirements is to, is to list how we are spending school district funds broken down by individual building. And again, the goal through ESSA is equity and making sure that we're there those numbers aren't identical by building. And, and one, of the, one of the easiest examples to think about why that might be is we're now looking at teacher salaries in an individual building. It's based on per pupil, but if you think about a building that may happen to have a number of teachers who are newer to the profession just because of that natural cycle, or a building who may happen to have a number of teachers who have gone through and, and gained a couple of advanced degrees, sometimes as a cohort, as a team that works together, those numbers can look a little bit different. We're not expecting drastic differences, but I don't know, we don't know yet exactly what the, what the graphs are going to look like. So that's one piece that will become part of telling our story in subsequent months. Um, the, the subgroup reporting isn't new, but, it's, still, but it's, it's, a sec, it's only the second year that we're really seeing all of that reporting. The other thing that we haven't had a chance to preview yet is we're told that um, the Office of Civil Rights data is also going to become part of the school report card, but this year's report card would reference data from the 2015-16 school year. And so that is something that's interesting on its face. But then, you know, this is data we haven't necessarily talked about. So it's behavioral data, which is going to have to do with the number of times that students were excluded for, from an environment, or perhaps were physically restrained. And we know that that doesn't happen often, but it, it, it does happen occasionally in our school settings. And so, you know, it also will look at some preschool metrics. So. Again, this is data that supposedly will be there. We're not sure what it's going to look like, so we'll, we'll be able to speak to it when we see which pieces they've pulled and how they've chosen to, to put it together. So again, we wouldn't be able to talk about it tonight necessarily anyway because it's embargoed, but I'm, I'm sharing with you candidly that we don't have a preview of that yet. So we will be working to tell that story um, if it needs telling and if it's something that is, that is picked up, but at this point, we can't even predict what the formatting will be for those. All of this, as I said, we've had some administrative review with our entire administrative team at a couple of meetings. Um, those principals have chosen to share and when they're going to share some of that data with their teams and faculty. And then to some of the points that were made about looking at our designations for what they are, but also acknowledging that we now are in year two of saying we're going to approach the state assessment in a, in a positive way and in an, in an invested way. So we have two years of, of more consistent data with that approach and that focus on our KPIs. So we really do want to use this data to see what it can tell us, because all data tells us something. And so the three pieces that we're really going to look at, first is that, is that preparation for this assessment platform. This is a unique platform for our kids each year. We want to make sure our approach is positive. Some buildings have already started looking at, are there certain standards or skills that get called out that, that really might need a little bit more emphasis? I mean, that's a fair question to ask. And, 
But the biggest one, and the one that we're really going to start exploring even as early as November as a district is, how often are we asking our kids to demonstrate their knowledge in the same way that this assessment asks them to demonstrate their knowledge? Especially when it counts, and, and the air quotes are intentional. You know, I mean, we do have moments, I think, where we are deliberate in asking students to explain their thinking and, and their reasoning and all those things. But I think sometimes we, we shy away from making those our own summative moments. And, and I, I think we have so much evidence that our kids do such amazing things that when we look at a state measuring stick and we sometimes say, well, I'm not sure that that's an accurate representation of what our students are doing, that's one of the questions we, that I feel is gonna, is gonna gain us some of the most traction in that direction. Are we asking similar or same types of questions and looking for similar or same types of responses as some of these assessments are? Because that's not teaching to the test, that's just thinking about the way we're asking our students to demonstrate what they do know in a way that's, that's only gonna be beneficial for everyone. So those are the questions we're going to look to in the coming months. So that takes us to the last slide, which is are there any questions about those last pieces or anything else from the board in general? I have a question, just a couple sure. comments actually. Um, going back to the slides you showed about the school improvement work and the SIP template, yep. who at the building is doing that work? So most typically it's a building leadership team of sorts. Um, I don't want to say that in every building right now that structure is, is specifically established. As, as we have different administrative turnover, I think we've, we've looked at all of those different structures. Mo there are at least a handful of teachers who are involved in data review over the course of the year. And I think our, our long-term goal is that it really is a full assessment of the school in, and the data and everything we know by a team of teachers led by the building administrator leading up to this process. A um, couple comments. Um, one was um, for the, at the, actually the direct towards the board. Um, I think that we should commit ourselves to having a conversation at a future meeting on the site-based expenditure reports um, because we've always talked about equity, um, and that I don't believe. I'm just speculating, but I don't believe that the reports are going to show that we are spending equitably. Because to your point, like you said, we have no control over um, how many teachers at. El Sierra have advanced degrees or have 20, 25 years of, 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 uh, of service, and if, if they are being compared to a new a building next door, Kingsley, for, for example, that has um, all a, you know a very young staff with bachelor's degrees and, and not much more education, uh, we want to make sure that we can tell that story to the community and that we are open because that's going to be on the report card now, and everybody's going to be able to dissect that. And um, again, since we all we talk about equity um, on the board. I've been here, I think we should have that, that conversation in light of day. And the other thing is just a, a housekeeping item. I think we, met, we talked about this on the telephone, um, but we probably should have this meeting next year, not before October 30th. No, it's, a, it's a great talk point. About, and uh, I think about that these designations yeah. again with, with our community. And that just reflects the shift in our past practice to our new, as it's like, current practice right. with the way we approach that. Absolutely. So Greg, just a, a, a couple of things. I, um, first of all, what you just said about the timing of the meeting, I think we're all in agreement there that, um, you know, this is a much more beneficial meeting if the scores are out there. Um, having said that, though, there is some benefit that just having a broad discussion about the uh, definitions and everything before those scores are out there. But we do agree, how do we line that up, whether it's that same night they come out or, so we will certainly be looking at that. Uh, the reason it happened this year um, for the public is just because the um, guidance from ISBE came out so much stricter than it has been. Um, in the past. In terms of the site-based expenditure report, I think we'll get an opportunity to first initially discuss it at the November 11th meeting as Justin goes through and shares all those scores. We'll also have that report out there to view. Um, we can certainly have a deeper conversation at a, at a subsequent meeting, but that'll be a, a great opportunity for us to just, you know, maybe even throw out some questions that we could research further and then bring that back to the board at a later date. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was very thorough. Thank you, Thank you, Justin. Thank you Justin. I, I just want to echo that as well. Um, you know, having been witnessing all of the work behind the scenes for Justin and then all of our staff members that were here tonight, um, it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of sleepless nights coming into all this. And uh, the other thing that I want to just echo from our building leaders and then Mr. Sissel as well is all these individual uh, building meetings to speak specifically about uh, the individual 
scores for those schools. I think it's just so important, and it's a unique thing that we do in our district, and then we have 13 schools across the district. So, Justin, um, thank you very much, and, and your entire team for all the hard work that they're doing uh, around this. It, it's really great work, and uh, we look forward to the school improvement process and really uh, getting a chance to uh, continue to revamp that as well. With that, we'll move on to our reception of visitors. The board is allotting a 30-minute time frame for an extended opportunity for the board and, com and community communications. Anyone wishing to address the board is asked to state your name and school attendance area. You are encouraged to limit your comment to three minutes so that everyone has a fair opportunity to speak. We ask everyone to be respectful of time limits, be respectful of others, and otherwise abide by board policy. At this time, do we have any cards? No cards. All right. And if there's anyone that would like to, to speak, please step forward. You can grab the microphone. And um, I don't want to cause a stampede here. <laughs> <laughs> Good? All right. And with that, I have a couple of announcements today. Uh, the Financial Advisory Committee. Uh, we'll be meeting on Friday, November 8th at 7 a.m. over at the ASC. Uh, we'll have uh, a community coffee with the board. That'll be a Monday, November 11th at 6.30 p.m. at Village Hall. That's right before our regular board meeting on Monday, November, November 11th at 7 p.m. at Village Hall. Uh, and with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Motion carried. Meeting has ended here at... 839.